This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. At the stroke of midnight on that great holiday Gonna have a ball And that ain't all Gonna chase the blues away I'll be bringing in a brand new year Bringing in a brand new year Gonna have a dance Take a chance of romance Bob, Good morning. Year. Monday morning You are dialed to Deep South Dining Right here on MPB Think Radio Hope you had a lovely holiday season I know that I did, and there were a lot of good eats around the house. And as I mentioned in the intro, there seemed to have been an awful lot of people who were going non-traditional this year, maybe not doing the turkey and dressing routine and trying some different things. That seemed to be the case on our Cooking and Coping Facebook page. There were an awful lot of people weighing in throughout the holidays, uh, sharing what they were cooking and different recipes they were trying. So it was an interesting uh, holiday season for sure. Uh, And Java had, uh, we had worried about our, about Java's fried pies. coming in. And so how how did that turn out Java? It turned out good. My aunt Dilsey um, in Oxford, she would, they were her and um, my mother's sister, my aunt, and uncle were able to make a make a halfway trip. I can't remember exactly where they stopped, but halfway between Jackson and Oxford, uh, they met up, uh, exchanged, you know, some gifts uh, since we all couldn't be together on Christmas Day, but exchanged some gifts. And one of those gifts was a pan of fried pies. <laughs> Save the day, <laughs> which was which was which was perfect for me because, um, like I like I've said on this show, it's just a holiday. It has become a holiday tradition, even for myself. I don't think my aunt knew just what she was doing when she just you know made them each and every holiday. Just like, hey, let's make these fried pies. But I come to expect these fried pies. <laughs> and if I don't have them, then it's just kind of it's kind of off a little bit. <laughs> well, I feel that same way uh, about um, dressing, uh, stuffing, oyster dressing, particularly. Although I did not make it uh, this year for Christmas, I did make it for Thanksgiving. And uh, for me, uh, the, the holiday season isn't c- quite complete unless I, I make this dressing. Now, this year, I actually substituted oysters. Uh, with crab meat. So I had a slightly different variation. Yeah. And it was almost like a giant platter of, uh, of crab meat stuffing. It was really good. Well, that's cool. And like you said, with the the non-traditional, um, even at my house, we, um, went to my, my parents' house and ate, uh, like always my dad, he fried catfish made, uh, made some spaghetti and um huh. and that was our um that was our you know christmas dinner we usually would have a turkey dressing and kind of a similar thing to thanksgiving but this year like i see a lot of people uh went non-traditional and uh, like i said we had fried catfish and and uh and spaghetti well you know that's an interesting combination uh fried catfish and spaghetti I, i've actually seen that uh, here, there, and yon. I remember back in the '80s when uh, we owned Walker's Drive-In. This uh, fellow and I, jo- Joey Mitchell, and I owned Walker's Drive-In, and we took it over. And the cooks there uh, were serving on Fridays. They were serving fried catfish with a side of spaghetti. And I'd never seen those two dishes paired side by side, but man, it was very popular. We we knew not to mess with the catfish and spaghetti because that was what people. Uh, had come to expect. Now, on your fried pies, uh, what uh, what fruits were in the? Were they all one fruit, or was it a variety of different fruits? Uh, yeah, that this your, this year, your auntie made. Yeah, this year it was only apple fried pies because for whatever reason she uses the she uses the um, 
the dried fruits and yeah. she's only yeah. able to find she was only able to find apple last year um it was i guess a shortage on apples and and peaches and things <laughs> she used to um make apples peaches um and but last year she made some apricots but she couldn't find uh. the, she couldn't find the apricots this year so it was just i mean they were all apple i mean i wasn't complaining i ate the last one yesterday but uh <laughs> <laughs> so i was you know I, I i was fine but um yeah it was it's something about those dried fruits that they couldn't they couldn't keep them together this year hmm. well i guess you know no surprise. Everything that we have come to know and expect to be normal this year has certainly not been normal. Maybe it was in the shipping supply chain. Maybe it was in the harvesting and warehousing. Who knows uh, what happened to to the dried fruit this year. But hopefully in 2021, there will be no shortage of uh, fruits uh, for Java and his family's fried <laughs> pies. So, you know, uh, during the holidays, we, we often share memories. Um, and again, as we were talking, certain traditional dishes. Uh, but today on the show, one of our most enthusiastic members of our Facebook page, Cooking and Coping, Joe Sherman, he's going to share uh, a food memory with us. And, and we'd love to hear from our listeners who have food memories around the holidays, or a lot of people have... Uh, very specific dishes that they cook for New Year's and New Year's Day. Uh, and we'll talk about that later in the show, too, uh, about the significance of the greens and the peas and the pork and, and all of the different sort of traditions uh, during New Year's time. So uh, one thing that Carol and I have been looking at on the Internet a lot and following are, are these what they call food trends and predictions uh, for, for 2021. And, and you know, uh, some of the past ones were the, you remember this job of the instant and fake foods of the fifties and sixties, like instant mashed potatoes. Yeah. That's always funny to me because I know, um, you know, speaking to grandparents and older, uh, individuals in the family, there was a time when these things didn't exist. And mm. I, you know, I, I, I've been here. I've always had instant potatoes, uh, uh, potatoes in the box <laughs> and tang and cheese whiz. But it was something when those things were coming, you know, coming to fruition and, and being widely available. You know, some people were like, what is this mess? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think a lot of those things like tang came out of the space exploration. Uh, and America was trying to develop foods for astronauts and space travel and, you know, people who were disconnected from Earth for a short while and now at the space uh, center. And uh, so, so anyway, I think a lot of those foods were developed in the 50s and 60s uh, as we begin to explore outer space and uh, send um, uh, a human being to the moon and, and figuring out things to eat and drink uh, in, in outer space. Now, in uh, 2010, there was uh, a wacky flavored chip. I'm sure you know this one because you are the mac and cheese monster man. <laughs> but there was a cheddar bacon mac and cheese chip. You remember that one? Yeah, I can't remember I, uh, which which potato chip company. But, you know, each and every year they come out uh, with some kind of crazy combination. And I think 2010 was kind of the launch of it. And it just was, you know, any combination, any food we can put together and make the chip dust. I think that's what they were trying to do. But I can mm, cheddar, wow. cheddar, <laughs> cheddar bacon, mac and cheese. That's that's not bad on the chip. But uh, I don't know, Southern biscuits <laughs> and gravy. And uh, they would they would have like um, um, hot wings and type of flavor. It was it, it got kind of crazy. Yeah, and then the year 2000, it was bacon on everything. You know, bacon added to everything under the sun. Even even so bad till it got to, like, bacon ice cream. Like, it just makes Ooh. makes no sense. But, I mean, you can buy bacon soap if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I really don't want to. How about you? <laughs> no, nah, I'll let that one pass. I'll let that one pass. I'm not a big fan of bacon bits either. I know those were the rage there for a number of years, particularly on salads. They would put these 
faux bacon bits uh, or freeze dried bacon bits. I'm not quite sure what they were, but but I, I wasn't a big fan. How about you? I know another thing too when it comes to bacon, it's always a big debate, especially for people who try to be on the health more healthy side of things. Is either bacon, turkey bacon. Or just the um, like tofu bacon or faux bacon, and it's yeah. like some flavors you cannot. Uh, I guess bacon is what all fat and grease. <laughs> you can't <laughs> well, you, you can't all. make that into uh, <laughs> into a healthy dish, even though a lot of people try. <laughs> you know, you mentioned turkey bacon, and back in the day when I was a music promoter and a festival producer. Uh, we booked a show with Willie Nelson, and I'll never forget on his rider, on the ancillary part of his contract that talked about what he wanted besides the money that he would be compensated with. He had listed turkey, bacon, and eggs uh, as, as his after-performance meal. And we we had to go all the way to Memphis back then to, to find search. turkey, bacon. <laughs> it was, there were no... There was no turkey bacon in the in the Metro Jackson area, but uh, we did find it. So finally, Willie Nelson did get uh, his turkey bacon after he finished playing his set at the Jubilee Jam. I don't remember exactly what year it was, but it was uh, quite some time back. Well, if anybody could command a trip to Memphis for some turkey bacon, it would be Willie Nelson. <laughs> That's right. That it, it, it was the least we could do. All right, we're going to take a little break here. Uh, and when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the other upcoming food trends and New Year's resolutions and New Year's uh, meals that, that makes up uh, what we call the New Year's Day meal. We'll ask you to stay tuned. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. Welcome back to Deep South Dining. Malcolm White here with Carol Bucket. Hello, Carol. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, Mal. How are you? Uh, all is well as we approach New Year's Eve and New Year's Day and hopefully putting 2020 deeply behind us in the rearview mirror. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to that, and I know everybody else is too. But um, I've been working on my resolutions. How about you? I don't have any yet, but... Uh, I'll, I'm sure that something will pop up. You remember my last year's resolution was to gather more and to have more friends over for dinner. And, and uh-oh, had a little that pandemic that interrupted well. that one. <laughs> so, you know, I always say, you know, we plan, God laughs. So, exactly. uh, so uh, at the, we didn't get a chance at the top of the show to talk about what you've been eating and cooking. Uh, you want to share a little bit about what's uh, been going on at your house uh, during the holidays and maybe your Christmas your Christmas dinner as well? Yeah, I mean, it was a great cooking week, like, you know, for most everybody. But uh, this year we had a Christmas brunch, very small, very socially distanced, but um I used the bounty of the land from where we are. We had deer sausage, um, had some wonderful cheese grits. And the best thing on the menu, though, was a gift from you, the Virginia ham that you gave us, the salt-cured Virginia ham. We had a whole lot of ham and biscuits. Well, I'm glad that you all enjoyed it. You know, um, a Virginia country ham salt-cured is not... Uh, everybody's uh, fancy. Uh, it's a little bit too salty for a lot of people. Uh, it, you know, it's a p- p- very particular flavor. And if you don't slice it super thin, paper thin, uh, it's often a little tough and chewy. But man, uh, you know, since uh, getting into the Norris family, uh, you know, Kara's dad is a big enthusiast for the Virginia. Uh, ham. He grew up in the uh, northern neck of Virginia, uh, up in the uh, Chesapeake area, and his family always uh, slaughtered uh, hogs and cured their own. 
uh, ham. So this is something that uh, is a big deal to him. And so I've gotten really interested in it. I use it for all sorts of stuff. I, I certainly put it on a ham biscuit, which Kara made some delicious flaky southern biscuits uh, yesterday, and we made uh, ham and biscuits. But but also, you know, I made up a giant pot of red beans and rice using the uh, the ham hock, the bone from the ham. And man, those things turned out great. Well, I saw that picture posted on uh, on Facebook yesterday, and it it just looked delicious. The biscuit looked delicious, but I must say, I have been drinking gallons of water <laughs> <laughs> ever since. I just uh, it, it was amazing how how salty it was. Yeah, it, it is very salty, and I think that's shocking to a lot of people. And so it is to be used very sparingly. Uh, whether you're using it in the case of letting it be your, you know, salt meat for your red beans and rice, you do not add any additional salt. You do not need additional salt when you're using uh, this ham on a biscuit. You don't need to add any salt if you're using it as a soup stock uh, or a gumbo starter. But uh, just as you use it, uh, you know, be mindful uh, that it uh, a little bit of uh, Virginia country ham goes a long, long way. Well, I have plans for the Virginia country ham on New Year's Day. Uh-huh. I've been you know, considering the New Year's menu, and I believe that we need all the luck, all the prosperity we can get. So I know that, that greens, leafy greens, symbolize folding money and dollar bills uh, and prosperity. And pork is about forward progress. You think about you have the pig and its snout and moving forward. So I'm going to have dollar bills with forward progress Uh, for my New Year's Day. Very good. Well, there are these things called uh, New New Year's uh, food trends. And I know you and I have been sort of texting back and forth about some of the trends. you know, every year writers and cookbook authors and public relations people and scientists mine the data for our eating habits and our patterns and our purchases to figure out what it is that is ahead for food trends. You got any idea about what uh, some of those might be? Well, I think a lot of the new trends come out of the experience that we've had over the past year. And home cooking is going to continue to be a huge trend and you know, one that I find interesting because I've been feeling it myself is a new trend towards not wasting anything. People are mm-hmm. becoming much more aware of throwing away food and you know, people who don't have food. And I found, found myself you know, using every part of everything I cook and you know, holding back leftovers. If there's a little bit of fish left, make fish stew. Yesterday, I you know, took apart a turkey and you know, boiled the turkey stock, picked everything off the bone to make turkey gumbo, um, yeah, you know, just, just to use every part of it. And I think that that's so important. Yeah, and, you know, looking back at 2020, I guess we should not be surprised uh, that, you know, home delivery and pickup, uh, really dominated the landscape starting in March of, of this year uh, once the um, COVID-19 virus was identified and we begin to to take uh, drastic steps to uh, close businesses, to shutter, to stay home. All of a sudden, this, this sort of interesting uh, phenomenon turned into this, this major deal with with the takeout food and, and the home delivery. And this, this one service, DoorDash, which many people are familiar with, uh, did a state of the flavor report, and it listed its top 10 foods that were ordered in 2020. And guess what? Uh, right on top is chicken fingers and fries. I know that comes as no great surprise yeah, to anybody with yeah, children. Yeah, and uh, I also see mac and cheese, which is Java's favorite, Yep, yep. Um, all sorts, of, but but I, you know, I see Thai food, pad Thai. So if people are in an area that has um, Thai food, that's always a big thing, and Indian food. 
Yeah, the chicken marsala, uh, the one that we used to get all the time. Yeah, it's Spice uh, Avenue. It's Spice Avenue. That yeah. that made the list, and and California rolls, sushi made the list. So, you know, it's, it's so pretty many, diverse. So many people live in places where they don't don't have DoorDash and and these other delivery services. So it it's it, you know kind of an urban thing. Yeah. I don't, yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't know how many. Um, you know what size cities. You know, start start that type of thing. But I can tell you that they don't deliver out in Edwards, Mississippi. No, I would certainly doubt that they could find you out there. It's and, even you know, back to back to the trend about using everything. This is one that that really hits home with you too. It's pickling and preserving are going to be a huge trend for yeah. 2021. I think we saw the start of that this summer where mason jar lids were totally unobtainable all over the country because you know people were staying home and trying that for the first time. And you're a pickling man yourself. Yeah, I love making pickles and uh, using fresh vegetables from the farmer's market or from my yard uh, to put up um, in cans and jars. Uh, You know, another thing is this phenomenon of using Zoom or any of the online uh, apps uh, to do cooking classes. Uh, And and we saw a lot of that on Cooking and Coping, where people are are actually getting on uh, Zoom or Skype or some... um, other uh, communication uh, technology and sharing recipes, uh, you know, dem- doing food demonstrations and also, you know, using, using it for cooking classes. Yeah, our friend Elaine Trigiani in Italy has done a great job with that. I mean, she actually does hers and goes to the market and shows cultural sites and puts things back in her kitchen. And some of the ones I've enjoyed most are from our friend April McGregor, a Mississippian yeah. in Philadelphia. But she was missing gathering people around her table on Sunday. So she started doing, you know, a bigger table on Sunday. And there were people on, you know, on the call or on the Zoom from everywhere, from you know, Mississippi, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. Uh, I took a cornbread class and a biscuit class, and it was just, it was entertaining. Yeah, and last week on our show, of course, we had Vivian Howard on, uh, one of our favorites, and um, she has a new cookbook. And, uh, you know, we were talking about one of our favorites, condiments. And I shared with Vivian that you and I never met a condiment that we didn't like. Exactly. But I love the idea. You said, you know, you put, you take your condiments. I don't know if you were talking about pickle relish or uh, a pickle squash or something and put in soups and stews. But she really gave you high comments and said that was right on. Well, you know, her new cookbook is made up of these flavor heroes, as you know. And a lot of those are great additives, whether it's to a a pot of soup or to a uh, spaghetti sauce to a gumbo, whatever it might be. But it's really interesting the way she she lays out, uh, this will make it taste good, I believe is what she calls the book. Am I yeah, right? That's right. Uh, another thing I'm really interested in is that people are taking a deeper dive into black food ways. And we see that a lot on social media and cookbooks. There are lot, lots of new black-owned, women-owned local restaurants in 2021 but there's there's been such an emphasis on that and i'm hoping this year that we can have um tony tipton morrison who wrote jubilee which was the james beard award winning cookbook on on the history of african cooking on the show Mm -hmm. yeah so as we talk about these 2020 trends i did want to point out one food um that made the state of the flavor report from DoorDash that was listed, which is comforting in itself. And that is that apple pie remains a favorite of Americans. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Yes. And I don't know if you and Java had a chance to touch on his fried pies at the the top of the show. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know we got we got to that really quickly, Carol. <laughs> well, um, I have to say that this morning when I looked on our cooking and coping Facebook page, there was a comment under your post about the fried pies from Tim Pierce, one of our friends in Memphis, Tennessee, and one of our favorite posters. And it said, Carol, if you were lucky enough for Java to bring you a fried pie, this is how you reheat it. And he talked about putting it in the skillet. And I know I'm not going to be that lucky today, but soon, I hope. I'm going to get but the recipe even, and, and, and figure out how to make them. Because like I told Malcolm at the top of the show, I ate the last one yesterday. Oh, <laughs> boy. Oh, darn. Hey, but he thought about you as yeah, he was he, eating he, it. He did. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, talking about these fried pies, you know, you used to see them everywhere. You, you'd go in a convenience store and they'd have fried chicken and they'd have catfish and all sorts of other things under the heat lamp. But right by the front counter, there always used to be a little cardboard box with these fried pies laid out. Some local person was selling them for a fundraiser or somebody in the community was making fried pies and they were selling them there. But in New Orleans, they have a really famous one, Hubig. Hubig's. Oh, I love those things. Java, you know those? No, I don't. You gave me a new tip. So next time I'm in New Orleans, yeah. I will. I will search them out. I will. They have a, a, a sort of a sugar crust around them instead of flour. The exterior is a crunchy, white, almost like confectioner sugar type um, uh, exterior crust. Amazing. Filled with all sorts of different fruits and flavors, even chocolate, as I recall. Yes. And Java, I know that your aunt that makes the fried pies, is, she's from Oxford, right? Yes, uh -huh. she's in Oxford. Okay, well, there is another great fried pie place in Oxford, and it's the Chevron Station. Malcolm, I think it's the one on North Lamar Yeah, that has right. great fried pies. But I already had a plan to bring you some if, you know, you didn't get your delivery at Christmas. The Chevron Station, I, is that, a, is that a, across from Chester's? or, or, or? No. From no, the, I don't from believe the, that's the one. I think it's okay. from the grad from the graduate from the graduate. Hotel. Okay. But I actually I actually had a pie mule. Somebody <laughs> lined up to bring you uh, fried pies, but we'll we'll do it for another holiday. Okay, I look I look forward to it. <laughs> All right, we're gonna take a little break here and come back. When we do, we'll talk to our friend Joe Sherman. He's the former president of the Viking Culinary Group. Carol knows a little bit about that. He's also a very enthusiastic member of our Cooking and Coping Facebook page. So we'll ask you to stay tuned for that. We'd love to have you join the conversation. If you have food trends that you're interested in or you have predictions about what 2021 food trends might be, we'd love to have you join the conversation. If you want to talk about fried pies, that would be just fine, too. The number is one 877 Six seven two seven four six four, or if you just want to send us an email to food at mpbonline.org, we'd love to hear from you. Carol and Java and I will be right back with Joe Sherman. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Each week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. And I will remind you that if you miss any part of today's show, you can listen back by subscribing to the Deep South Dining Podcast or download the MPB Public Media app. And you can listen to this show or any of our previous shows anytime you feel like it. Carol, how about introducing our very special guest this morning? Our very special guest is my good friend and Malcolm's good friend, Joe Sherman originally from Greenville, Mississippi, so I know a lot of Delta folks are listening. And Joe has had quite 
an interesting career, everything from being president of McRae's to president of the Viking Culinary Group. And in that iteration, Joe, you spent a lot of time thinking and working on home cooking and how to bring families around the table and uh, you know, how for all of us to, to improve our skills. And it, it's really touched me that you and your wife, Mary Pryor, have been such active participants in cooking and coping. And, and the thing that's really hit me is how encouraging you have been to other people. And you, you're always, you and Mary Pryor are the ones that, that – you know, tell everybody they did a great job when somebody thinks they failed. Um, you know, I think that holds over from your Viking career. But what, uh, good morning, and why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience with cooking and coping? Well, first of all, uh, I don't know how we would have made it through this pandemic without it. Uh, it's a great support group, as you as you kind of touched on already. You know, uh, when you see people from uh, uh, like uh, – like Leslie Kelly from Washington, uh, Bob Yarber from Virginia, people Bob McCool from Meridian, uh, Tim Pierce from Memphis, and you feel a connection. You feel like after a couple of days, you're part of the family. And the first thing I get up in the morning is look and see what everybody did. And everybody is so supportive. And they share everything. They don't mind giving a recipe. The only recipe on cooking and coping that's held secret in a vault Somewhere in Greenwood, Mississippi, it's Jojo LaFleur's salad dressing, and that's where it ought to stay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know nobody will ever get that, and that's okay, because it uh, she deserves that. So uh, there's there's it's it is a great, great uh, support group. Um, and, you know, when you look on, I was looking at Leslie Kelly's post one time, and she said she was going to New Orleans to visit with um, – uh, Greg Sonnier's wife. And I said, is that Greg's wife? He said, yeah, well, Greg did a cooking demonstration at the Viking tent at the golf tournament. He was a fraternity brother, a good friend of mine, Jimmy Rosen, Jimmy and Tilly Rosen. So, you know, and then Bob Yarber worked at the Vicksburg uh, newspaper with my cousin. So it's, it's like one big happy family. And if I could get them all in one room, I just, we, Mary Pryor and I just hug them till they couldn't be hugged anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, uh, after our uh, current unpleasantness is over with and we can take off these masks and hug each other again, you know, there are plans for a reunion. So no, we, we really need to keep that. So, but anyway, um, you know, it's been great. Uh, and Carol forgot to give herself credit for my job at Viking. She and Mary Pryor touched base at the bar at Bravo one night and the rest is history. I was there 12 years and loved every minute of it and learned a lot. Uh, I went from merchandising cosmetics and intimate apparel to selling what I call skillets back then, but it was <laughs> cookware, cookware and cooking utensils and uh, spatzel makers. So for yeah. lack of a better word. So it was great. A great experience. Well, you really embrace the lifestyle because you have become, you know, such a great, home cook and I know you probably cooked before but it's really gone to another level and I enjoyed so much seeing the pictures you posted of your grandsons making Christmas cookies and it's it made a real impact uh you know on other people so um was that just a so, mountaintop experience for you well I, I started making Christmas cookies with my mother and my first recipe that I ever used, nobody can see it but you guys, but was this little card right here. Then I moved on to Great Grandmother Dodie's Cookies on page 287 of the Southern Sideboards. And then I moved on to a recipe given to me by my brother-in-law's sister. And it is phenomenal. I'm trying to emulate uh, Campbell's Bakery as best I can. But I baked cookies with my mother. Then I baked them with my son's. Uh, uh, Anthony and we baked him till he was probably a freshman or sophomore in high school then he got married when he got married I baked him with his wife Allie who's very creative and loves to decorate cookies and then when the grandchildren were born I started baking them with them uh, Alex uh, is nine years old has a nine his ninth nine-year-old birthday is tomorrow and 
he loved making the cookies. He called up his dad called up and said Alex wants to bake cookies so he came over we started with the cookies and I don't know if you saw there was a, a ugly Christmas sweater cookie with a hole punched in it well I, <laughs> when I make a wreath I, it doesn't have a hole in the middle so I use a, a bulb baster I take the bulb off I take that in shove it in there to create the hole well Alex liked it because what he would do is he'd take the other end of the bulb baster and blow in it and blow out the piece of dough and eat it and I told him, I said, I'm going to have to call Children's Hospital, and they're going to say, what's wrong with your child? And I'm going to say, he ate five pounds of raw cookie dough. What do I do next? So uh, he also, I don't know if you noticed, the, the wreath was pink. So I'm asking him, what color icing do you want, Alex? He says, I want pink. I went, pink. So he started coloring the pink. Well, he wanted to make it look like the pink donut we sell at Dunkin' Donuts. So, you know. Uh, he, but what, what a great memory for those kids. Well, we had a great time, and. Uh, you know, he enjoyed, he likes to use a paintbrush. I don't use a paintbrush. I use a iced teaspoon, pour it on there and rub and coat it with the back of the spoon. He likes to use a paintbrush. So I thin the icing out a little bit so that he can do that. And, uh, his, so tomorrow is his birthday and I've made some number nine cookies for his birthday. And I created a number 21 for 2021. So we're going to try to bring in, uh, the new year with, uh, with, with a lot more things <laughs> better. You know, you're talking about the cooking and coping side. I think um, uh, Jackie DeShannon, the song Jackie DeShannon wrote is what cooking and coping is, what the world needs now. So, you know, it's it's a, it's a been phenomenal. The, the, you know, we look forward to it. Um, it's, it's just amazing. So, you know. Well, Joe, we appreciate you joining us, man. Thanks. And don't go anywhere because we want to talk to you more about uh, your cooking and coping and also your cookie making. we got a caller on the, on the phone, Sue from Kill Michael. Sue, what's going on? Well, y'all were talking about saving everything and using everything. My mother made fried pies of all kinds. One of the favorites was she would dry the peach peelings and make sort of a paste and cook that for the fried pies which was very wow. good. And also, the, the peach peelings. Huh, that's interesting. And also, she would cook down muscadine hulls and cook that down and spread it like a cinnamon roll for a muscadine roll. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That sounds that delicious. That is very good. <laughs> that was yeah, very Yeah, that's, that's very creative. I, I love You talk <laughs> about using everything. Who's ever heard of using, using peach fuzz? Uh, you know, no, the peach peels, the peach peels, the peeling. Right. Well, it has <laughs> yeah. the fuzz on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it does have fuzz. And my daughter thought we were saying four eyed pies, like one, two, three, four, like four eyed <laughs> pies until she was six or seven years old. But That's my great. Created, four eyed pies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the other thing is y'all need to try Barbara Gant's Lacey Cornbread. It is so good. Now, that's another great YouTube show. Right. But the lazy okay, cornbread, we'll lazy cornbread. The lazy cornbread, when I took it out of the skillet, I would sprinkle it with coarse salt. And we stood and ate them as they came out of the skillet. They're so good. Mm. That's the way I did the biscuits yesterday. As soon as they came out, I was all over them with butter and jam. Didn't even let them cool one bit. And, and I love them that way. Well, Sue, we wow. appreciate you listening to our show and particularly taking the time to call in and sharing uh, these cool things uh, with us. We've got a caller from Oxford, Joe, that wants to ask you a question. Esther's on the phone from Oxford, All right. Mississippi. Hey, Esther. Hello, Joe. I didn't have hey, any huh? comment on speaking. I just ah. wanted to say hello. I am still amazed that you are alive and kicking. I'm Esther Joe from back in the day of McRae. <laughs> When you and Ronnie came. Oh, Esther Joe. Yeah. Hey, how are you doing? So Esther is from uh, uh, Clarksdale, right, Esther? That's right. I'm from Clarksdale. Uh-huh. Clarksdale, Mississippi. And uh, Esther worked for me when I was at McRae's. Uh, what relation to Wally Joe? Uh, Wally Joe is, when we're not related, but uh, I okay. know Wally, and he's doing fine up in Memphis. You know, you know, he's got uh, what is it? Uh, uh, is it Acre Restaurant? I forget the name of it. Yeah, up there, fine dining. So you live in Oxford? 
I'm living in Nashville, but I'm in the process of moving up to Germantown, Tennessee. And I just wanted to say hello and tell you that I still remember you and Mary Pryor and love y'all. Well, thank you, Esther. Love you, too. Thanks. See? Esther, we appreciate you listening to our show and calling and particularly <laughs> catching up with your old buddy uh, Joe there. That, that sounds like y'all go way, way back, Joe. We do. She was there. She went to the hospital when my son, Anthony, was born. Uh, 43 years ago. <laughs> wow. <laughs> mm. well, Joe, back to memories. Okay, I saw the cookies, but yesterday I saw the picture of your father's uh, kibbe maker. Uh, so talk a little bit about your Lebanese heritage and what does it take to make kibbe? Well, first of all, I'm so excited to have my own, a, a real meat grinder. Um, uh, my my dad had it on the counter in the uh, utility room. And whenever anybody asked where something was, he would say, well, it's, on, it's, it's by the meat grinder. No matter what it was, it was by the meat grinder. So my sister took the meat grinder. She was not at the time using it. So I got it. I picked it up yesterday. And, you know, kibbe is basically <coughs> an eye around uh, meat that the fat's trimmed off and it goes through the grinder twice. Okay. Top round. Uh, for every pound of meat, you add uh, a cup of butagal or wheat, and we use the number one wheat, soaked for 15 minutes in water, a small onion that's put in a food processor until it's nothing but water, and we only use salt and pepper. And then you mix it up, and you, we eat it raw. Don't cringe out there, audience. We eat it raw, or you can bake it, or you can fry it. Now, in the Mississippi Delta, salt and pepper were the only spices. But uh, a lot of the other people, especially in the Jackson area, will use allspice uh, and things like that. And, you know, while I think it's OK, you know, to me, I put allspice in my and cinnamon in my sweets and I put salt and pepper on my protein. So that's kind of the way I do it. But it's it's uh, it's a tradition. And with the way that things are going now, with the meats all coming in prepackaged, the Kroger's won't grind the kibbe meat. And the kibbe meat has to be, if they grind it in a grocery store, it has to be the first grind of the day. It has to be on the clean plate because if they think you're going to eat it raw, they want to make sure it can, it's not contaminated. So it's got to be on the first grind. So I got my own plate, and I can, I'm going to um, buy some um, kibbe meat, some eye round today to make some kibbe. I'm going to go ice some uh, cookies for Alex's birthday tomorrow. And um, that's kind of where my day is uh, playing out. But, the, you know, the, my favorite Lebanese dishes are kibbe, tabbouleh, which I could just, you know, eat my weight in, uh, and uh, grape leaves. And we make grape leaves quite often around here. <laughs> Mary Pryor's mastered it. She's knocking it out. So. Now, Carol, one of the gifts that I got for Christmas was that you delivered to my house a full complement of Lebanese dishes from a woman you said uh, over in Vicksburg who cooked it. And man, talk about kibbe and uh, uh, the, the Lebanese dishes. That stuff was great. What'd you have? What'd well, you have? These, uh, my friend Mona Nicholas, Joe, who's actually your neighbor. Two doors down. Yes, I was gonna take yes. Her some, we were going to take her some grape leaves and they, weren't, they were out of town. Well, so, well I know they'll love it, but uh, yeah, Mona married into a Lebanese family. Right. And she was going to Vicksburg to get her Christmas Eve dinner and ask us if we wanted, you know, wanted to get in on this. So a, a very talented woman named Lena Hand in Vicksburg uh, made it. And we had kibbe, we had stuffed squash, we mm -hmm. had cabbage rolls, we had spinach pies, and we had uh, baklava. And looking at all that food and two of us, I thought, who would like to share this? <laughs> so I made up, yeah, it was, you can see them, see them right there. And uh, so I made up a big tray of food and left it on Malcolm's porch. Um, and it was oh, I delicious. Bet. My, my only my only comment about about the kibbe and Joe, I posted this under your uh, meat grinder last night was while I was thanking Mona who delivered this wonderful dinner, uh, while I was thanking Mona in one room, uh, our dog Jala <laughs> sniffed out sniffed out the kibbe, and by the time <laughs> I, got, I got to him, he had taken the top off of. 
you know, there there was only like a fourth of the pan <laughs> left. So Malcolm, that's why I shorted you on the kibbe. Right. Did they have? Did, did they make their kibbe and put pine nuts in it? Were there pine nuts in it by any chance? There, yes, there were pine yes. nuts in it, and this was uh, a baked a baked kibbe. Yeah, that a baked kibbe is you know, you know, I think everybody would eat that. Now, a funny story is. There's another cooking site out there. I'm not necessarily, you know, it's a Lebanese site. And I joined the site because I get to learn all these recipes. But most of the time they're talking about them in Lebanese. And and I don't know what they're talking about because growing up, the only thing you learned in Lebanese were the cuss words because that's all they, <laughs> that's all they said. So, yeah. but anyway, so one girl was going to make, we called baklava bitlewi. So she was going to make baklava on Christmas Eve for the first time ever. Now, what an undertaking. So she started listing all the things she had. And one of the things she said she needed, I think, was rose water. Can you get rose water? It been her list of things. Instead of putting uh, phyllo dough, she would bought puff pastry. So, <laughs> so can you imagine what baklava, what baklava would look oh like? Oh, my gosh. Pastry? <laughs> it looked like a small <laughs> empire state. <laughs> Well, Joe, oh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna a a ask you and Mary Pryor someday when you're when you're making to send a little present to Java and Malcolm and me. I, I want some, look, some of love Mary that. Pryor's. That's how this really. that's how this whole thing started. I called yeah. to find out if y'all were in the studios. We wanted to bring you something, and I invited myself to the radio show. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's how we roll, and we're really it. glad that you did come, and we look forward to getting some of that tabbouleh that you're talking about. You're going to get some. You believe, believe me, I'll make it up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, got any other food memories that you want to share with us from your childhood, Joe, or just growing up in the Delta, things that you remember that, that bring back great memories? Um, I think one of the great memories is um, Sunday mornings, on, on, no, Monday nights. Uh, the, my dad was the, was the, was the, uh, Pat, the, 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 the family priest, the pastor of the Catholic church, best friend, no matter who he was. And every Monday night, I'll always remember this. I had many memories with my mother baking. As a matter of fact, one time we even made bagels before you could buy bagels. And she was, uh, she indulged me and we boiled them and did the whole thing. And it was great. Uh, just spending time with her, spending time with my grandmother in Shaw, Mississippi, where she cooked, uh, and we learned a lot from her. But I'll always remember Monday night football. Uh, Dad would have the priest over. He'd cook him a steak. And Father Farrell, uh, Patrick Farrell, who was here at one time, I think he's retired now, would come in. Daddy would make him, make him a bourbon and ice. And Patrick Farrell would sit there and spin it around with his small finger and sip it and just enjoy the night. And that was, that's something that's just, they, they were always there. They were always welcome. And my parents welcomed everyone into their home and gathered around the table. And the one thing that I had in my Viking office that my mother had in, in the kitchen, it was cross stitch was no matter where I serve my guests, they seem to like my kitchen best. That's, <laughs> that's so, great. So in my new year's resolution is I'm going to join Weight Watchers and AA immediately. <laughs> Come on down. We'd be glad to have you. All Joe right. Sherman, we appreciate you joining us this morning. Deep South Dining is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio. We are funded by generous contributions from listeners like you. Our show is produced by the one and only Java Mac and Cheese Chapman. <laughs> <laughs> for my co-host, Carol Puckett, and myself, and for our special guest, Joe Sherman, please stay tuned now. For now, you're talking with Marshall Ramsey and Southern Remedy at 11 a.m. Next Monday, we'll be not taking time off. We'll be right here. We actually thought we were going to be off today, but we're not off. We're on. We look forward to 2021, and we appreciate you tuning in to our show on MPB Think Radio. <laughs>